A very warm welcome to everyone to the Vedic Astrology Masterclass Series. I am Ms. Preeti Sharma and I will be your host for this session. Today's Masterclass will be given by Sri Andrew Foss. He will be teaching about Jyotish and a conscious planet. Now, I take the pleasure of introducing our teacher for today, Sri Andrew Foss. Sri Andrew Foss is a trained scientist who researches and teaches Vedic astrology. He has a PhD in computing science and is also an Oxford physics graduate. He is the author of the acclaimed book and ebook series, Yoga of the Planets and the software Sri Jyotish Star. Dr. Andrew Foss is the president and co-founder of BAWA, that is British Association of Vedic Astrology. He is a Jaimini scholar who teaches, consults and provides software to the leading practitioners as well as to the students of Jyotisha. Thank you, sir, for your benign presence today. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the digital platform to Sri Andrew Foss. But before, we will now begin the masterclass on Jyotisha and a conscious planet. A gentle reminder to all our viewers that any questions that you might have for our teacher today can be typed and posted in the comment section. At the end of the session, the speaker will answer them one by one. Dear Sri Andrew Foss, over to you. Thank you very much. Namaste. Namaste, everybody. So it's a great honor uh, to be invited by the Foundation to speak here and uh, amongst uh, a galaxy of great astrologers. I'll just uh, start with a mantra. Om Gam Ganapataye Nama Om Gam Ganapataye Nama Om Gam Ganapataye Nama Om Aing Guru Saraswatyaye Nama Well, when I was thinking of what to speak today, I was faced with the fact that our civilization is facing a serious crisis. And even though there are so many interesting things, really there's only one thing that's important at this stage, which is the what is going to happen over the next hundred or so years. And how is our civilization going to survive? So the question is, can Jyotish make any kind of contribution? Uh, at least we can, as individuals, we can try to make a contribution. So the question is, you know, what is the real nature of the problem that's facing us? What are possible solutions? And then I thought it'd be interesting to look at the charts of people who've made a serious effort and are currently making a serious effort to uh, make a difference in this field. So just before we start small advert, this is my book, uh, Yoga of the Planets. Now, this is the, you know, traditionally, especially in the South, but I think throughout the country, uh, the pundits have been using these uh, mantras or names, the sets of 108 names of the uh, of the Navagrahas. You know, there's this tradition in India of using the uh, sets of 108 names. So one time, you know, many years ago when I was in Kodor, which is not so far from Bangalore, so it just came to me that these these names, sets of names were a little bit scattered. Uh, no one had really developed anything. Uh, certainly there was no translations or commentaries. So somehow I started working on that by the grace of David Mukambika. And uh, it took about 21 years, but the, here's the book. So there's all the mantras of the 
Navagrahas with translation and commentary in English. And uh, in India, it's available under the title Mantras of the Navagrahas. So this was developed um, there in Karnataka uh, and over the years, wherever I was. It's, it's available on Amazon and Flipkart in India. So let's look at this just from the purely materialistic point of view initially. So in 1972, and this thing, this has been going on for a long time, this whole question of what's going to happen to the climate. So a group of MIT scientists published a quite famous uh, uh, essay, or I think it came out as a book, The Limits of Growth. And this predicted that by the middle of this century, uh, growth would come to an end. You know the concept of growth. You know, there's a lot of, uh, it's almost a religious thing amongst the financial people, growth, 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 you see, because everybody wants more and more. And so it's measured in terms of percent. So we want to grow by so many percent. And the fact is if that you grow by, I think, 7% a year, which is like we've seen in China, then after 10 years, the whole size of the economy is doubled. There's twice as much money and economic activity. And can you imagine you keep doubling and doubling? And then what happens? Because all of that is dependent on the continuous input of resources, which is all extracted from the planet. So, you know, from the water and the land and the, the soil, a lot comes from the soil. And the whole bounty of nature is basically being looted for the sake of this growth. And there is, we live on a small planet, it's really quite small. It has limited resources. If there's a big enough drawdown, it becomes obviously limited. So this is our problem. We've, we've reached the limit of what we can, or at least according to the scientists, we're coming to the limit. So they'll say, and what has happened is since 72, there's been periodic rev looks at this, looking at the models that the scientists developed then and seeing if they're working compared with what's actually going on. And the latest was put out this year and they found that the, the predictions were very accurate actually. And the, if you look at the model compared with the data of the last uh, 50 years, it looks like growth is going to hit a limit at 2030. Now 2030 used to seem like a long way away, but right now it's just a few years away. We're already in that decade. And after that, there's a very, according to the models, there's a serious possibility that of societal collapse. So this is a, not a small thing, this is a very big thing. And it's the collapse is predicted according to this, especially of the declines are caused by pollution, including the greenhouse gas pollution, which is exactly the problem, the problems we are facing, different kinds of pollution. Now, what we would like is a stable world. The stable world is not a growing world. It's just a world that's maintaining so that there's a decent life for everybody, even if we can't all be Jeff Bezos or something. <laughs> Obviously, we can't. Anyway, a stable world requires that there is uh, a change in the values and policies. You know, we've had basically since the 80s, we've had a religion of growth not just growth, greed, I would say, would be the best way of describing it. Greed turned into the religion. Before that, there were other things that were considered important, but now it's just the markets and everybody hoping to get rich or whatever. So that has to change in some way. And there has to be some kind of limit to the industrial output. And the emphasis has to be given. This is according to the scientists, not, I'm not giving my opinion. So health and educational services have to be prioritized. It sounds theoretically possible, doesn't it? And then they conclude that if business as usual, uh, continuing business as usual, in other words, growth is simply not possible, even if 
there's this uh, unprecedented technological development and adoption, inevitable, inevitably there will be declines in industrial capital, agricultural output and welfare levels. So it's not just a matter of clever technology that a lot of people think, oh yeah, we'll just take, engineer our way out of the problem. But the scientists are saying that that's actually not possible. So my question is, are we capable, are we humans capable as a society of actually accepting, you know, say zero growth or even a small decrease? You know, in Bhutan and Sikkim, two of the neighbors, Indian neighbors, uh, they've developed this idea of uh, gross domestic happiness. You know, that sounds good, doesn't it? You know, I wonder whether the rest of us could tolerate that. You know, everyone would like to be happy, but how much are we, are we prepared to give up anything? That is the question. We're hanging on to so much stuff and then we have a list of more stuff that we'd like, you know, we'd like to hang on to that as well. But if we've studied anything of the Vedic, you know, the yogic and Vedantic knowledge, we would understand that, you know, it's, probably why we're miserable is all the stuff we're hanging on to. So we should think really, does all this stuff we've collected and we're trying to collect actually made us happier? This is the question. Because we expect the governments to do something. We say, okay, it's the problem is the leadership has to do something and there is some trying going on, but basically the government looks at it and it says, well, if we make some strict rules, if we ask people to do with less, then there'll be a rebellion, basically. People will say, no, no, you people aren't any good. We'll have some other leaders who will give us some hope without actually asking us for any sacrifices. You see, that's the risk. And we've already had a, an adventure into that arena here in the United States. And it wasn't good, you know. It just set us back for four years, really without getting into politics. So this is the problem. We should also consider that, you know, wealth, and here as Jyotishis, we're talking about Raja Yogas. What is a Raja? We look at the chart, we think, you know, this chart has some good Raja Yogas. What does that mean? Probably the person is going to become wealthy. And wealth generally means that we consume more energy, doesn't it? I mean, all throughout human civilization, more wealth means we consume more. We have more servants, more slaves, more animals, more all this. And today what it means, we have a bigger car, we have, we fly first class, we uh, have larger home. I mean, these are all things we want, isn't it? <laughs> but it just means that our personal production of carbon dioxide goes up, right? So we have to, we have to think realistically and, and rationally and compassionately from our own hearts about what it is that we're really looking for, you know, is this what we want? Should we be rejoicing over the Raja Yogas or being more conscious about the implications? I'm just saying it. So now before we get into what can, how we can go in a positive direction, we should think about how bad can it get? Because unless we, you know, there's this, there's this idea that one day we'll die, but basically, that's not going to happen. We're happy now. We're doing well now. We're going to enjoy now and worry about that later sort of thing. But we should pay attention to the inevitable, shouldn't we, really? Now, this new research by NASA, new research means 2019, though I only discovered it a few days ago, that they studied clouds and they discovered it's the first time anyone has really studied clouds. And they found that under the business as usual, which is what is going on now, that in about just a hundred years, the greenhouse gas concentration, which will have gone up to almost three times what it is now, will completely suppress the stratocumulus clouds that cover about 45% of the planet. That means all the cloud cover that reflects back the sunshine and the heat disappears. It disappears rather quickly over a few years and the temperature at the surface will go up by an average of eight to 10 degrees centigrade. 
well, about 18 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that will make large parts of the Earth's surface uninhabitable. Now, this is a very, I almost like serious shock when I found this out. And it, I mean, it's basically the end as far as the society as we know it today is. So this is not very far, 100 years is within the lifetime of people being born now. Now, the positive side of this is that whatever happens to the human uh, society, though some humans will survive, I'm sure, I'm 100% convinced of that. Population will be less, so that means that the production of carbon dioxide will drop down to essentially zero. So then gradually the uh, climate will recover. You know, there are some theories about permanently tipping into some hell, hellscape of excess heat, but it seems from what I've studied as a scientist that that probably is not going to happen. It's more likely that slowly, slowly, the carbon dioxide will disappear and in about 300 years, and this is based on data from the UK's top scientific body, Royal Society. In about 300 years, the climate will have recovered and it'll be like a new age. And I thought that was very interesting because in about 300, 300 400 years, the procession of the zodiac will be going into Aquarius. You know, we're in this Pisces, age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius will start. It hasn't started now, it's still 350 or so years to go. So this is an interesting concept and there's an article on my website about the procession and, and uh, how it's impacting human civilization. And pushing it forwards into Aquarius, I realized, and this was before I even thought about the climate change issues, that Aquarius has a lot of spirituality in it. I mean, obviously Pisces should have, but in reality, the real um, tapas we can say is more in Aquarius. So I think, and there's a special connection to K2 in Aquarius. So I personally feel that when we get into Aquarius, there'll be a new dawn of Vedic life on this planet. And this is not, we're not just talking about some airy fairy that none of us will see because the fact of the matter is we're all going to die and we're, chances are we're all going to be reborn when we get a chance, you know. I mean, if the drop, population drops, it may take longer to get a slot, but this is tr the truth of life, rebirth and rebirth, unless you get moksha, which is a rare thing. So there's a chance that we'll be enjoying this new Vedic life. So it is something positive, but it shouldn't stop us making whatever effort we can to try and mitigate the circumstances as they are now. So let's look at it from a bit more of the Vedic point of view. What we understand from the rishis is that the planet and everything in it is conscious. It is conscious. Animals and plants are conscious but they're rather like a child. So what happens is, you know, if there's food available, the species expands. It can grow very fast, but there's a certain point where the food runs out and then there's a die off and to a, a sustainable level. And then it starts expanding again. This is the nature, the way it works. And like on the plains of East Africa, where I was born actually, but where the human race is supposed to have started according to some theories, there's always been a cycle. You know, you see these plains of the Serengeti and all millions of animals. And when the rains are good, there's lots of grass. So the number of animals uh, expands. They keep on producing more babies. And, and the same with the humans. The humans have got their cattle. They're also moving around. Their numbers are increasing, the cattle increasing. It's all the good times. But the point comes where there's too many cattle, too many animals and the grass is being uh, destroyed basically. And then what happens is nature provides a drought. So there's no grass, a lot of animals die, some humans die. And then once the number comes down a bit, it rains again and the whole cycle starts over. So this has been going on for millennia. 
and it's the way that nature organizes things, you know. Now, these days, we got clever, like we can do something if the people are starving in Kenya, we just send a plane load of food. So it, nature's way of normally managing these things has been circumvented. I mean, it's good, we all want, don't want anybody to starve, but we have to understand that nature is not very limited. It has extraordinary capabilities and we have the pandemic and there are so many other ways that, you know, some balance can be applied. Now, if we look at the Vedic Shastra, we, we see this concept that the climate can be disturbed by the behavior of the people and they particularly refer to the evil-minded rulers, you know, the rulers who are inflicting cruelty on the people, especially the innocent people and the spiritual people. And this, uh, this misbehavior causes a kind of reaction. So if we look in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is the 10th book, uh, Gita Press version, so as this is a quote here, oppressed with stupendous weight by millions of detachments of daityas in the disguise of arrogant rulers and their associates, Mother Earth sought Brahma as her refuge, appearing as a disconsolate cow, its face wet with tears and piteously lowing. She told him of her distress. Realizing her calamity, Brahma, accompanied with Lord Shiva, proceeded to the shore of the ocean of milk, the throne of Lord Vishnu, along with her and the gods. So this is how the, the birth of Lord Krishna came about, because the, the earth could not bear the, the weight of this evil any longer. So, you know, these things are written there by the rishis, and we have to think, you know, how does the mother earth feel today? This is the question. Of course, you know, there was a great war, uh, the Mahabharata war, famous war, millions of warriors died, and then some kind of balance was restored. In the Devi Mahatmyam, this is also chapter 10. So again, you see that the evil minded uh, people, rulers, were causing, were torturing the planet and the innocent people. And there was an appeal to the, to the gods. And all the gods came together and they projected their, their energy. And out of their energies appeared the Devi with all her weapons. So there was a terrible fa fight between her and the demons and she destroyed them. So it's just mentioned here, the shlokas, where it's mentioned what happens after the Devi kills the, the demon and his army. And it says, when the evil minded was struck down, the world became peaceful and happy. The sky became clear. The f flaming clouds, the mass of flames and other terrors subsided and the river stopped flooding. So it's just interesting that they took, you know, they wrote these stories and they mentioned the climate consequences of the, basically the misbehavior of the humans and their greediness and how the, the uh, natural law, which personifies as these deities, can step in. There's always a battle. <laughs> There's always death, but Ultimately, it leads to this uh, beautiful state of balance being restored. So that's, you know, one wonders what is going on behind the scenes right now. So if we think of it from a consciousness point of view, you know, the basis of the creation of these three gunas, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Now the, the Sattva is, if sattva is increasing in us, we feel increasing contentment. The sign of sattva is you're happy with what you got. Something goes, it's not an issue. Something comes, it's also not an issue. That is sattva. So 
to whatever extent we feel that, that is our level of sattva. Now, human beings are typically rajas. I mean, that is, human life is rajas, but there's always some sattva and some tamas. And the sign of rajas is this dissatisfaction. Only sattva is satisfied. Rajas is dissatisfied, wants more and more and more. And that, of course, as we've seen, leads eventually to collapse because of the lack of resources. Then there's tamas. Tamas is corruption, criminality, conflict, society crumbling, failed states, mass migration, all these things are signs of tamas. And they come because people are lazy and careless. So we don't want to go down that road at all. You know, the shortcut, <laughs> you know, taking from other people and all that. So as far as humanity is concerned, we can always bet on the rajas being predominant. But if Raja starts to collapse, because it will eventually, then we will always have this choice. Either we turn towards the sattva, we turn upwards in a way, we could say, or we turn downwards towards tamas. This is what we're all facing really at this point. Now, it's very important that we consider these things in the bigger context. Like we were mentioning earlier, life is immortal, but the body is very mortal. The life we have on, on this planet is short, you know, it's just a few years. And all the stuff that we collect will leave us. We, we will not be able to take it with us when we, when we leave. As many people say, we came with nothing, we leave with nothing. So the question is, why are we, you know, endangering the future of the species by insisting on how much we have to collect when none of it is going to stay with us anyway? You see, this is the question. And I was reminded of this wonderful uh, statement by Yudhishthira, the great emperor in the Mahabharata. He was asked, what is the greatest wonder on earth? And he said, hundreds and thousands of living be beings meet death at every moment. Yet the foolish man thinks himself deathless and does not prepare for death. This is the biggest wonder of life. So if we look at it from a Jyotish point of view, Jyotisha, and you look at the, the 12 signs of the zodiac, they're really divided into three groups. So we have Bhur, Bhuva and Swa. This is how we understand it. So the first four signs, Aries the Cancer, you can say, is like Bhur. This is essentially the uh, childhood and growing up phase. We get conceived, we were born, and we get educated, we grow up. And then as we go into Leo, round through to Scorpio, this is Buva. This is like us dealing with the external world. Now we're a responsible adult, we have our own children, and all that is going on. And that is it. The Scorpio is really, and this is a viewpoint, this is not the only way of looking at the zodiac, but Scorpio ends with this great Gandanta, the greatest of the three, which is really the end of that uh, adult life. And the, the Swa, the last four signs is said to be the, you know, it's the heavenly space. It's beyond this world. So the transition from Scorpio into Sagittarius is the, is where Neriti is sitting, is, is the death. That's our departure from this place. And it's very interesting that according to Prasha, Mahashi Parashara, the first three Navamshas of Sagittarius are the Mula Trikona of Guru. Now, you don't hear much people talking about this, but the question is, why is that the Mula Trikona of Guru, of Brahaspati? Because that is the most important Thing. What happens next to the soul? When you die, what is going to happen next? This is being given by God to the rishis and the yogis, those who are have gone way beyond the limitations of this world. They can decide basically where you go based on the level of maturity and all the preparation work you've done in this lifetime and previous lifetimes. So, I mean, this is a big topic and we don't have time to go into it much today, but 
Uh, and there's a lot of detail that you can get basically from the Jyotish about this whole process. But it's very, very important to prepare. And if one can get into the sphere of some uh, enlightened guru, then you're very fortunate because that will get you the best possible future. The gurus take care of those who come into their sphere. So just looking at the 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 situation just a sort of summary we see that this the sort of situation of society that we've been enjoying for the last hundred years say predominant rajas little bit of sattva people have largely forgotten the sattva because rajas was going along so nicely they they think well you know it's optional extra on the side you know so that's in while if you go back couple of generations everyone was meditating at home at least in india nowadays you know how many of us meditate hopefully all of those who are attending this lecture do but it's not so common anymore is it and then tamas has also been controlled the rajas has been somewhat controlling the tamas there's plenty of it but it's been somewhat controlled but as rajas comes under pressure from uh, extreme weather resource depletion and so forth then it kind of shrinks. So there's a movement. Few people move up towards the sattva, uh, probably more move down towards tamas. But it doesn't matter because sattva is much more powerful than tamas. In the Yoga Sutras, it tells us, tat sanidao vaira tyagaha, which means that in the presence of that, awaken consciousness, vaira, the enmity, Tyaga is abandoned. In other words, the animals, the people, everybody starts becoming peaceful just because somebody or a group of people in that vicinity have become peaceful in a profound way inside of themselves. So I think this is the only real hope is that the, the sattva rises sufficiently to control the rajas and tamas and that will create a situation where people naturally accept the necessary changes. So, you know, I would encourage all of us to support those, you know, great people, those great ones who are making efforts in this area, who are perhaps developing uh, communities where there is genuine um, sadhana going on. In whatever form that that takes really so i'm not going to spend much time on this but soil degradation other kinds of these are all things that need to be actively worked on because it's all very well we meditation is good but what you notice that the, the real saints are not only working on helping people with meditation they're trying to improve the situation for the farmers and therefore the ordinary people i mean the soil has been spoiled by the industrial agriculture and it needs a lot of TLC. <laughs> and so the pollution in the environment, serious, all kinds of pollution is something that there has to be actual practical work uh, to improve. And um, I just think on this slide, I'm not going to talk much about it, but we have to be very conscious that there is a tendency by the elites to you know divide and rule this is how the british ruled india isn't it and it's very evil really you just create just differences between people who are happily living together so that now you can control both of them you know splitting these political parties is a bad one it's splitting people into what these vote banks and all that so all of this is not good and the trouble with the social media these days is that based on algorithms that try to give you what you want, isn't it? You know, it's Facebook, Google, whatever. They're, they have algorithms, which all seem very clever when they were written in Silicon Valley. But what we see now is that, you know, if somebody has some kind of terrorist attitude, then immediately they're given a whole lot of videos about how to be a worse terrorist. And that sort of thing is going on. So, I don't know if any of you are 
connected to the senior people in these big tech companies, but there has to be a serious change in these algorithms. People, you know, it used to be there were actually laws in some countries that the newspapers or the TV had to show both points of view. All that's got forgotten now. They tell Facebook, where's that? I mean, there needs to be uh, some kind of shift in the algorithms so that, you know, the different points of view are presented to people so they can think about it and not being forced, essentially funneled into some black pit where there's only one concept. And now they become unable, they can't even talk to their brother and sister because they read some other, they got funneled into some other pit, you know, it's a very important, critical thing, actually. Then there's the, what we can do more practically is things like tree planting projects, uh, water conservation, the, all these sort of practical things where the, the whole community can get together and do something. Everyone benefits. You work with other people, it doesn't matter what their religion, what their attitudes are, because you work with people, you have a shared need, we all have shared needs, and thereby we realize that there's actually no cause for conflict. This is what's needed. You know? anyway. So I'm not going to get industrial agriculture and fishing, we all know the problems with that. So having had my little speech on that topic, and you're born with me, thank you. We're going to look at some charts of people who are very proactive about the environment and try to understand from an astrological point of view what their, uh, you know, what their interest really is. So I just thought, now who are the people I can think of from my little knowledge who have been uh, influential in the environmental area? And we're going to go a little bit beyond environmental. And the first person I thought of was Rachel Carson. This is going back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, she's passed away now. She was an aquatic biologist, and then she became a full-time nature writer. And she wrote this book called Silent Spring. This was her real big contribution. And it had a huge impact because you know, these things like DDT, these pesticides and all have been discovered and now are being used for, I guess, mosquito control as well as um, on the crops and all that. And it was, it was a big deal. Everybody thought, this is great. This is technology solving our problems. But she observed that it was having a terrible effect on the whole balance of nature. So she blew the whistle and it had, you know, it had a significant effect. People woke up a bit. So they switched from DDT to other poisons. Unfortunately, the chemical industry just did a great end run around it. But anyway, still, it was the first awakening, especially over here in the States. So this is her chart. You can see Saturn in Pisces in the Lugna. And uh, she has Mars and Moon in the 10th house. and. Now, the question is, what is the really the, 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 the most important Rashi or sign for the environment? And I think most of us would agree that it's probably Virgo, yeah, Kanya. So if you have Pisces rising, Kanya is in the seventh house. That's an important house. Now, Kanya is a very interesting sign. It's a very dual sign. Everybody knows that it's a dual sign. But not necessarily everybody knows that it has two rulers. So we know Mercury is the uh, obvious ruler of Kanya, Buddha. But there is also, uh, it's also considered by many uh, leading astrologers to be co ruled by Rahu. They say Rahu's Mula Trikona is in Kanya. If you actually accept this idea, just as a possibility, hypothesis, we can say, and start looking at charts, you'll see how powerful and effective it is. And you'll get completely convinced. Anyway, I was. So if we look at this chart, we see there's no planets in Kanya, but Mercury is in the third house, which is the house of writing. And Rahu is in the fifth house, which is the house of books. And if you look at her, her uh, dashas, you see that 
you know, look at it. She became sick in Rahu Shani. This is when her her health started becoming seriously problematic. And within a couple of months, she had a diagnosis of breast cancer. So it's all during Rahu Shani. Shani is in Marana and the Lagana. Then when Rahu Mercury started, she published Silent Spring. And this, she got, you know, she became on all the TV and the radio and she appeared before Congress. And that presentation for Congress was a pivotal event. Of course, it was also broadcast on the television and that led to some action. So that all went on during Rahu Mercury and then Rahu Ketu started and she died. So I think that's quite convincing. So I would like to mention one more thing, which is that uh, the day of the week you're born is very important, the Varish. So she was born on a Tuesday. And we know that uh, the Varesh, the Lord of the Weekday, here Mongol, Mars, is has a major effect on the general uh, vitality and the agony in the body. But there is also another factor, which is that from the Varesh, we can see what our interest, what our sort of interest is in life. Interest, not in the sense of hobbies, but the sort of theme of one's life. But for that, you have to count five from the Varish. And when we say count five, we mean in the order of the weekdays. So people born on a Tuesday, you have to see Saturn in the chart. So her whole thing was not so much, it was about the environment, but her whole focus and her research and everything was all based on toxins, toxins. And of course, Rahu in the fifth house could do that. She's got Rahu in uh, cancer. So she was an aquatic biologist and she studied pollution in the waters. So that's Rahu in cancer, but she's also got Saturn in Pisces. So that's an important part of it, isn't it? And then what is the consequence of these toxins in the waters is disease and death. This is all shunny. So I'm anyway, just mentioning that. So this is a, another lady, great lady, but much more recent, Greta Thunberg, we all probably all heard of her. Uh, she, in August 2018, she went and sat outside the Swe Swedish parliament uh, on strike for the climate. And I love this quote of her. She said, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, OCD and selective autism. That basically means I only speak when I think it's necessary. Now is one of those moments. I think that in many ways, we autistic are the normal ones and the rest of the people are pretty strange, especially when it comes to the sustainability crisis, where everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all, and that they just carry on like before. I mean, she says it like the rest of us may realize that that's true, but what are we doing about it? So she, maybe she's right. This is very similar to the quote of uh, Yudhishthira, you know, it's a modern day Yudhishthira, we could say. So this is her chart. And uh, see Virgo rising. So what's this happen? Mercury has gone to the fifth house and Rahu has gone to the ninth house. So the ninth house, if you have Rahu in the ninth house, your tendency will be to try and start a revolution of some kind. You want to transform the world uh, in some way. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's very interesting, really. And of course, Mercury is there in Capricorn Saturn is in Gemini, so there's a Parivartana exchange of signs between Mercury and Saturn. 
the fifth house and the tenth house, which is a fantastic Raja Yoga, isn't it? I mean, you'll see all of these charts I'm showing you. I didn't select it for this, but they all have these powerful Raja Yogas. But in this case, even though they they live a decent life, but they're, uh, you know, the Raja Yoga is not a normal kind of Raja Yoga. It's an environmental Raja Yoga. They're getting prominence and fame because of their efforts for the for nature, we could say. So, of course, Greta has been uh, spoken at the United Nations. She was invited to Davos. She's, you know, she sailed across the Atlantic on a sailing boat uh, while being televised. And I mean, she's she's had enormous amount of um, ex public exposure, we, we could say. But she's definitely not somebody who's using her Raja Yogas to just uh, consume carbon dioxide. Now we notice the moon is in Digbala. See that beautiful moon? Of course, it's, the moon is very close to the sun. And exactly when her moon Mahadasha started, she went and sat outside the Swedish parliament. You know, before that was just maybe her ideas were developing, but the moon started and there she was, the public figure. Interesting. So James Hansen, I had to include James Hansen. Some of these charts don't have a advertised time, so I've done a little bit of rectification. May or may not be wrong, but it does seem to work very well. He spent his life working for NASA, and he started off studying the atmosphere of Venus. You know, Venus is famous for being a hothouse. There was too many clouds too much uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so the whole surface of the planet, which used to have oceans and all that, it heated up, all the water evaporated, and it turned into a hell, our concept of hell, that's Venus, right? So it looks very pretty from the outside, you just wouldn't want to go inside the atmosphere. Um, anyway, he realized, he developed these uh, climate models based on the Venus atmosphere, and he then started applying them to uh, the Earth. And after a while, he realized there was a problem. You know, Houston, there's a problem. And during a Senate meeting on the 23rd of June, 1988, this is 88, Hansen stated that he was 99% certain the Earth was the warmest it had ever been. And there was a clear cause and effect between the greenhouse gases and global warming. In addition, the likelihood of extreme weather was steadily increasing. This is 1988. The problem was, even though everybody heard it, I mean, the people listening heard it, there was powerful forces like the fossil fuel industry who rolled out a huge effort. They spent untold millions to create confusion so nothing would be done. <laughs> and it worked. So here we are, like, what? 30, 40 years later, just starting to think, hey, look at the floods, the fires, and all these other calamities. And, uh, you know, we had plenty of warning, but now at least everyone can see it. It doesn't mean anything happens, but it should. So this is uh, an attempt, simple attempt at rectification. I'm not saying I... Uh, I'm not saying I've spent a huge amount of time on that, but if this is the right chart, then it is certainly a very powerful chart. This guy has been standing up for the environment, not just 1988, he wrote a book in 2012, uh, and he's uh, on the subject, and he's been very active. He's so active that I think Trump would have fired him if he hadn't retired, you know. So we see, if suppose here's Gemini rising, we have Mercury and Aquarius in the ninth house, and then all these other beautiful yogas, the fifth lord in the tenth house, exalted. See, it's Venus in the tenth house. I mean, you know, that doesn't prove that it's, the rectification is correct, but you can see uh, that it is. And then, of course, Rahu is in Virgo. 
So if this is right, then we have uh, Rahu and Mercury Parivartana between the fourth and ninth house, another fantastic multiple Raj Yogas. This is heavily over so many Raj Yogas, right? The sun, of course, has Digwala, and he was born on a Saturday. So Saturday people are always a bit concerned about issues related to Mercury. So, and then you see that Mercury is in fact the Matri Karaka. It's a very critical planet in a chart. So that's how Mercury became, you know, fundamental to his uh, his life and that doesn't change if the lagna changes now i thought well, i had a whole list of all these wonderful people and then i thought maybe i should put somebody in from the other side as it were so of course the people who who've most confused and resisted any change on the climate has been uh, Exxon Mobil. I mean, they would deny it, but the fact is everybody knows. So the most recent CEO of Exxon Mobil is Rex Tillerson. Now, this man is not the one who really did all that. That was the previous CEO before that. But um, this Rex Tillerson's attitude is, and he joined Exxon in 1975 as a production engineer, he's an engineer. And then he steadily rose through the ranks until in 1999, he became one top level executive vice president, and then he became the CEO. And he had to resign a few months early before his retirement because Trump decided to make him secretary of state. Now his comment was, he made a number of comments like this. He said, I'm not disputing that increasing carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere is going to have an impact. It'll have a warming impact. Then he said, it's an engineering problem and it has engineering solutions. And so I don't. The fear factor that people want to throw out there to say, we just have to stop this, I do not accept. You see, don't do anything, just, invest in technology well you know it's very easy if you do a little bit of research on the internet you'll see all the different technology options that people have worked on and none of them none of them really show any signs of fixing the problem it's not an engineering problem but that's what they like to say isn't it so let's have a look at his chart Again, I had to do a little bit of rectification. So we see uh, Saturn's in Virgo. Now it's not that everyone with Saturn in Virgo is anti, no, no, that you can't say. I mean, I have Saturn in Virgo, but it's not the greatest place to have Saturn. And here it is in the fifth house. So in the fifth house, which is very much about your, um, this is also your interest, you know, the fifth place, that's the whole point. So. He's got a thing, it's, in, it's, it's sitting in the Virgo, but it is Saturn. Saturn represents the fossil fuel industry. And so that's what he went for, and it has an impact. It's wearing down the Virgo, isn't it? So you notice the Parivartana between the fifth, fourth, fifth house and the 10th house between Saturn and Rahu. Uh, so, it's a powerful chart, of course, you see. Now, he, he was born on a Sunday. So Sunday people, you have to look at Jupiter. See, Jupiter is the Atmakarika. It's in the 11th house of income. It's in Pisces. So it's with debilitated Mercury. So, you know, he's profiting enormously, huge profits. And, and Mercury's maybe going down, <laughs> possibly there. But there's no real motivation there for um, caring for the Earth. 
I'm sure you'd say he cares, but how much did he do? Then there's David Attenborough. I have to include David, David Attenborough because he's so, we love him so much. He could have been the director of the BBC. He was offered the job, but he, he resigned from the BBC to avoid that job, basically, so he could go on doing natural history filming in all the famous films. And uh, so um, it's through his films that he's, he's had the impact that he's had. He's raised the awareness tremendously. And there he is at this wonderful age, still going strong. He's in Rahu Dasha now. So we see Rahu is in uh, Gemini in the Lagna, with Mercury as the Art Makarika in the 10th house. And you see the, that yoga in the 10th house. This, you know, this, the chart, I think it's correct. He's got exalted sun in the 11th house. But to see the yoga in the 10th house, it's fantastic for someone appearing in the public as a, you know, he speaks beautifully. It's cancer in the second house, Lord in the 10th with Venus. I mean, naturally you like to listen to his voice, isn't it? So, and his, his whole thing is Mercury. And he's also born on a Sunday, Saturday. See, so Mercury. His whole thing, everything in this chart is Mercury. So then I wanted to give a couple of charts of people on another level, I would say. People who are not only uh, working in the environmental field, but they're also promoting sattva and raising consciousness. So I start with Sri M. I guess probably all of you have heard of Sri M. He's a well-known saint. He's a very great, great soul. And he has many initiatives. Of course, he's primarily a teacher of Kriya Yoga and he's done so much good like that. But anyone, you know, who genuinely cares about anything in this world sees the need. There's so many needs. So he's done a lot of work in education and he has this tree planting projects in India and abroad. You see him planting a tree there. And then there's a, he's doing a lot for rainwater harvesting and water conservation. He started a um, Jal Seva Sangatam. So, you know, it's something that's really very important. If you live in India, you can see, but in many other countries, you know, critically important for survival. So you see the working on all the different levels. It's something very praiseworthy, I would say. This is his beautiful chart. So Capricorn rising, Saturn is there, Leo in the eighth house. See the spiritual energy, Moon and Jupiter in the twelfth house. He's a, he's a very humble and great soul. And you see that Venus. See Venus in Virgo? Note the Venus in Virgo. Nobody should start thinking, hey, Venus is, is weak. No, this is not the point at all. Look at the Venus. Mercury Paribartana between the ninth and tenth houses. And Venus is also the lord of the fifth house. So it's uh, very powerful actually. Of course, he's got the sun in Ketu. It shows that he's primarily a spiritual leader, but the, uh, the importance of, of Mercury and Virgo is very clear. He's another person who was born on a Saturday. And then Sadhguru, another South Indian great saint. So if you live in Tamil Nadu, I'm sure you are very well aware of the work he's done for the Calvary watershed, the whole system which is so critical to the state. And because of all that effort, they're planting more than 2 billion trees. That's the project. And not just planting trees. I mean, you've got to work with the farmers who are living along the banks of the rivers. And there's so much involved 
in essentially restoring the nature, but doing it in such a way that you don't take away the livelihood of the farmers, in fact, you improve it. I mean, it's, it's just a massive, massive uh, thing. It's not just putting seedlings in the ground. This is so much bigger than that. And it's been so much developed that the union government has taken it up, the whole plan, and other state governments as well. So it's spreading in India tremendously. And then he has rural regeneration projects. And it's a beautiful quote, I thought, how deeply you can touch another life is how rich your life is. You know, if we all really thought about that and made it our mantra, then the world would rapidly become a better place. So he, this, this little picture I've got, I got off one of their videos, thank you. Uh, I just thought this was a nice point. So Isha Foundation, that's his foundation, envisions a society which will develop a deep culture towards the environment and keep this planet livable for future generations. This is the effort. These guys, these sort of people could make an enormous impact, much more than the regular people like us. So, you know, I hope that uh, he and, and there are other saints and very wonderful organizations, especially in India, but around the world who are really trying hard and doing very good work, you know. So we appreciate all of them. And this is uh, Sadhguru's chart. See, look at Virgo, Jupiter and Venus. Um, unfortunately, I've put the, no, <laughs> the Vamsha chart in the South Indian style, but he has Jupiter and Venus in Virgo. And the Ardma Karaka is Mercury. You can see it's an extraordinary chart, actually. That Shani in Digbala. He's, he's uh, born on a Tuesday. So that you can see that Shani in Vrishchika, uh, Anuradha in the seventh house. I mean, it's this, this, the, the power of the, the spiritual power is just extraordinary. But that blessed uh, fifth house, and uh, you know, it's just, there's so much, uh, some, it's just a wonderful chart. And that Jupiter and Venus notice in the 10th from the moon. These charts are really worth studying. So our appreciation to everyone who's making any kind of effort. I hope we can all participate with them or on our own, but working in, with others is probably more effective, but we can do whatever we can do. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Andrew Foss, for the insightful class. Our audience definitely appreciated it. Okay. We now move on to the Q&A session. The questions will come up on the screen, sir. You can kindly read it out loud for the benefit of everyone and then answer them. Great. So uh, someone was asking, Kali Yuga began with Krishna's death approximately 5,000 years ago and will continue for approximately another 400,000 years. Do conditions for humans get progressively worse as Kali Yuga advances? I, you know, I, I don't think any of us can answer this question. There's so many clauses, you know, so many sub considerations because, for example, Many people feel that within a major period, there are minor periods like minor cycles. Uh, of course, Sri Yukta Shwa, uh, in his book he wrote, uh, he discussed this kind of idea. So we don't really know exactly where we are in the whole thing, but um, there's bound to be ups and downs. I think that we can probably all agree on. Now, 
there are many things that we could talk, have discussed, like there's these cycles of the Jupiter um, Saturn. You know, Jupiter and Saturn have conjunctions about every, uh, what about, 20 years. And there are, these conjunctions go on in, in a particular um, uh, tatwa of, of sign. There's a cycle of about 250 years with each tatwa, but then that in between there's a sort of overlap. So we are at a very critical point in this at the moment because uh, we've just finished a, a 250 years of the fire element. So really the whole of the industrial revolution, electricity and everything, this has all come up while these uh, conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn have been occurring in fire signs, ugly signs. And now we're into the earth. And of course, we can look back in history. This has happened a few times in recorded history. And generally, there's been some sort of a downturn. I mean, there's some, definitely something different is gonna happen. And, you know, <laughs> as we adjust to a more earth orientated uh, world. So there are these different, there's, uh, these different ways of looking at it. Then they're studying the procession uh, as I say, we're in Leo at the moment, uh, not the, you know, it's a bit challenging actually, but beyond that, I can't really answer your question. So next question. So even if Rajas and Thomas is increasing day by day as Kali Yuga is increasing, will Sattva people will increase? If so, what is their survival rate? Can you please throw some light? Well, I think, you know, it's very difficult for us because there's no measure of, of sattva, like, see, when I first came to India, it seemed like there were a lot of saints and, and then I kept meeting people, oh, my guru just died, he was a great saint. And there were still people living in those caves in the Himalayas, you see. Now I go back and look at it and you find all those caves are now on Google Maps they're all marked out and they've all become tourist destinations. Peace have moved in, turned them into small businesses, they're collecting money. I mean, it's like there are no caves left for any poor people who want to go and do sadhana. So it seems like there's some kind of deterioration, but then, you know, there's some regeneration force that's always present. So it is like these, you know, Sri M and Sadhguru and others. I mean, they're developing their own ashrams and that's always going on in India, isn't it? It's just a perpetual regeneration. So I remember one thing I could, you know, cause I personally don't know, but I remember I was listening to Amachi, you know, uh, when I visited her ashram in Kerala and this was a few years back. And she said that when she was asked essentially this question, she said, things are not going to get better. Cause everyone thought age of enlightenment, everything's going to become great. She said, no, I don't see it becoming better. But, she said, the awakening, people are going to be awakening like grapes appearing on the vine. You know, there's going to be continuous stream of people awakening in the midst of the darkness. So I thought that was, you know, very interesting and hopeful, really. Okay. Uh, India spiritually advanced in tantras, homas, havan, etc., going on day and out, day in and day out, unlike other parts of the world. Please explain the impact of this on environment compared to other pockets of the world. Now, I spent a long time with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and his probably principal concept was that if you could have a group of, especially large group, and he focused on at the time 7,000, because there were 7 billion people in the world at that stage. So, he said, if I could gather that number of people and have them meditating regularly together in a group, that will keep the whole world in some kind of balance. So there is a large group actually maintained by his organization in uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh. I don't know how many people they have there, but you can see these different, uh, the, some of these saints are collecting I know Sadhguru has a plan for like 100,000 and then he wants to have another 25,000 here in the States. So, I mean, if this happens, 
it will have a huge effect. And there's no need for restricting to India. It's just that, you know, India, as you say, has this tradition. But the tradition must not be forgotten, you know. It can't be left just to the pundits doing the pujas, where everybody has to participate. Next question. Saturn in the seventh in Sadhguru's chart promises good Digbala. But Saturn aspirating Lagna is bad. <clears throat> How come it's bad? You know, if you look at the chart of saints, you see Saturn is always prominent. You know, how, I mean, you know, if Saturn isn't influencing strongly, how are you going to sit quietly? It's not going to happen. You know, Saturn is the one that makes you sit down and close your eyes. So it has to be strong in the charts of saints. Many saints have it in the Lagna. He has it in the seventh house. And when I start, you know, my when I've been studying Jyotis with my guru, Pandit Sunday Rat, we spend a lot of time on the charts of Sri Krishna and Sri Rama because these are considered gold standard charts. So where is Lord Krishna's Shani? Is it not in the seventh house? You know, that seventh house Shani is very critical in his in his uh, chart. So if, if, if it's, I mean, what do you know? You can't pass any aspersion on Sadhguru because you have to apply it then to Sri Krishna as well, isn't it? Can't be bad not bad. In December 26, 2019 in Sagittarius, there were six planets in that house that triggered coronavirus for this Earth. Well, that's the theory, right? But coronavirus actually started before that. We think it started October, November. And then uh, maybe after December 26, it became more of an uh, more worldwide spread, we could say. So, I mean, we could see what happens is if you have an event like a, a, a collection, a stellium, then if you can possibly draw a chart for that time and then run the dashes forwards and see if that gives you, because sometimes it does work well to do a technique like that. Um, but you could also for example, I mean, I picked the time when the World Health Organization declared a pandemic for the planet because it's a time. They said this is the time when they declared it as a pandemic. And that chart was enough to tell that it wasn't going to finish in 2020. It was definitely going to run into 2021. So, I mean, you know, everyone can pick their own chart and use that. It's up to you, you know. I must say about these uh, pandemics, they usually, and this is what my guru said, he, they last for typically about five years. So, you know, another two, couple of years probably. Hopefully. But then you see, you don't know what nature has in mind. We have to behave better. If we, our behavior improves, nature doesn't have to be sending its forces to deal with us, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not necessarily a problem. We must remember those instances from the Mahabharata and from the Devi Mahatmyam and other texts. You know, even the Gita, Lord Krishna explains these things. Ramya says, is it necessary to have in birth chart? Have what, please? Oh, I see. Some combinations for being an environmentalist. Oh, I'm sure there are many possibilities. It doesn't matter. We're all environmentalists on some level. You know, we should do our best. Cultivate more green. You know, we want somehow to give nature more support, right? not chopping down trees or try to avoid things that cause other people to chop down trees, you know. The looting of the planet is so out of control. She's saying innumerable people in the world, even after being born in a spiritual family, aren't inclined to it. Does an environment have an influence on a person? Yeah, it's, the, it's uh, that's right. In Jyotish, we say Desha um, Kala Patra, right? So Desha means the, the place you're born you know, the situation in which you're born, basically. 
in terms of place, Kala is in terms of time, the social situation, and of course Patra is the chart. So the chart is only one third of the story. And we do know, I mean, like if you were born in India, like say a hundred years ago, there were very high likelihood that you would be introduced to some form of meditation, whatever religion you belong to, and you would be practicing it. Now, if you're born in the last 50 years, maybe, maybe not, you see, and if, who knows going forwards, it's all to do with the, the Kala, we can say. So, Gidesha and Kala. But generally speaking, if the parents set a good example, the children will follow to some extent. It's always worth setting a good example. I mean, in, in uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells us that if you're very, very lucky, in other words, you're very, uh, you know, you seriously work on your spirituality, then there's a small chance that you'll be born into a spiritual family. So in other words, getting born in a spiritual family is actually very difficult. And so it's obviously like winning the jackpot. It's the most fortunate thing. Bear that in mind. Thank you for all those great questions. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Andrew Foss, for the excellent masterclass. I would like to take this opportunity to inform the audience that the next masterclass session is on Saturday, September 12th, 2021. The class will be by Sri Bangalore Niranjan Babu, and he will be teaching about Vastu Shastra. See you again there. Also, if you would like to stay informed about the activities of the foundation, we encourage you to visit our website. It's appearing in the scroll or join our Telegram channel. Namaste. Namaste.